I would have waited for somebody to call the meeting to order. The Committee of the Whole is called to order. And thank you, Silas, for reminding me. I was sitting here waiting for somebody to call the meeting to order. <laughs> thank you so much. And somebody asked me, how should you be addressed? And I thought, well, Madam Chairman, and I've been waiting to say this for weeks. So not only am I one of the city fathers, I am now a madam. <laughs> Will you call the roll, please? Solomon. Here. Eberg. Here. Eberg here. Serta. Here. Davis. Excused. Roth. Excused. Kittleson. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Radke. Here. Segale. Here. Stefan. Excused. Susha. Here. Van Ashman. Here. Van Der Wiel. Here. Montemayor. Here. We have uh, uh, 12 present for excused. The quorum is present. We'll proceed. This evening, we're addressing two issues. I think you have your agendas and you have the RO in front of you and the resolution. We're going to talk about RO number 570506, agenda number 439 by the city clerk, submitting a communication from Susan Hundley requesting that the Common Council consider in closed session the settlement offer that was submitted on October 18, 2004 regarding the room tax litigation, as she believes before an appeal is filed, it would be a gesture of goodwill to give the new council the opportunity to consider the settlement offer. We're also going to take up the discussion of resolution number 290506, agenda number 476 by Alderman Manny, relating to the city contract with the Chamber of Commerce relating to tourism promotion. And Alderman Manny's resolution means we will discuss and decide if we're going to create a study committee. That's the only thing we're deciding on that tonight. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, before we get started, just for house rules, um, because there is a, um, a some because we're being asked to go into closed session, I would make a motion that Alderman Susha um, be giving her presentation to the council in open session, and also to, I would um, open the floor to Dee Olson from the Chamber of Commerce too, as questions arise during that process. Second. I second. We have a motion and a second. We'll have a roll call vote on that. And the motion is, to not allow Alderman Susha to give her presentation in closed session. And the second part of the motion is to have Dee Olson speak to us. Correct, for questions and answers. Those two parts. I means saying no. Deeburg. Oh, I'm sorry, discussion, discussion, discussion. Yes, is there a discussion? Thank you. Manny, Alderman Manny. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure where I stand yet. I want to hear some conversation. Um, off the top of my head, I wondered about each one being heard in closed session as one other alternative. And we could also call each one back, perhaps, with further questions that we might have. They could make uh, their statements, and we could ask questions. That person would leave, the next one would come in. We could deal with it in that way as well, perhaps. Um, that might be broader. It, uh, it might be an alternative way to look at it. I'm not sure what I think yet. Thank you, Alderman Manny. Alderman Sagali. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think this should be an open session because I know a lot of people are, are very interested in this topic. And I think since we are talking about open government, I think all of this needs to be brought out in the open. And what better way of doing this to hear these two ladies um, speak on something that is affecting the, all the taxpayers in the city. Thank, Thank you, you, Alderman Sagali. Alderman Dan Burr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Like uh, Alderman Sigali said, everything was in the newspaper. Whatever we had in our packet was in the newspaper. It's been on WHPL. Everybody's been talking about it. The, I don't see why we have to go into closed session and do any talking, because everything's out in the open here now. Let the people that are here listen. And we have got the TV, don't we? Yeah. 
they, they should be able to hear and, and see whatever we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alderman Danberg. Alderman Silas Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say that historically, the discussion would happen before closed session. And then if we had questions, we would call them in the closed session. And I just want everybody to be careful not to treat Alderman Susha differently because she's an alderman. In this case, she's a citizen. So I think when she talks, she'll be a citizen. So that's how we should treat her as a citizen, as an alderman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This, this uh, question is basically directed to the city attorney. Um, uh, Mr. City Attorney, is it not wise when there's a case, a litigation case uh, pending, to go behind closed doors and discuss that amongst ourselves rather than in, in the open? Um, I'm kind of new to this, but every time you read the newspaper, you know, they've uh, settled this or that, and it's been done behind closed doors where the people have been free to talk and get things done properly rather than trying to hold back and, you know, so things don't get brought out in the open. That shouldn't get brought out in the open. Um, can I get your opinion on that? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, the, the item is put on as a closed session, and it's for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel who's rendering oral advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the city with respect to the room tax litigation which is involved. That's, that's what the exemption uh, from the open meeting law is all about. It, it's that sort of a narrow purpose uh, to confer with your legal counsel to talk about strategy concerning this litigation. Uh, I, I guess my opinion to you is that it's best to confer with your legal counsel in closed session. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the nature of litigation is it's somewhat adversarial. There's two sides, and uh, and uh, I guess, but it, it's up to the council. I mean, the council doesn't have to vote to go into closed session, and I guess I'll discuss what I can in open session. If you don't want to do that, it's it's uh, you know really for for the council's benefit, but I feel it's incumbent on me to advise you that I would recommend going into closed session. Thank you, Attorney Steve McQueen. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. One other question I have is just a quick follow-up. In this letter here, we have how much of this has actually been out in the open? I mean. The people have been talking about it, the paper's been talking about it, but actually how much of this information is public information at this point from this, uh, this attorney that are representing Ms. Hundley, Ms. Susha? Thank you. Uh, well, that document was submitted to council. It's a public document. It's, uh, it's a public record. So, uh, you know, whether everybody has seen it or not is not really the issue, but it's it's a... It was submitted as a public document. It wasn't submitted just uh, like to me in confidence or anything. Thank you. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think we're, we're talking about two separate issues here. My motion was that Alderman Susha speak to the council in an open session because she has been um, party to this legal matter. And we as a city, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. McLean, we're not currently in litigation in a sense that we've already won. And what I'm asking is when Alderman Susha gives her presentation, that that information should be shared with the citizens. But more importantly, if questions arise, um, and I know Alderman Manny had um, suggested maybe taking one person in and out, I think it's more beneficial to have D. Olson present. That way, if if issues are specific to the chamber's responsibilities, we can address those at that time without having this. You come and you leave, and I think it would be more time effective. And just what is your discretion? I, I know me and Alderman um, Susha have been professional. We've talked about this, and we both um, are on opposite sides of the fence. As far as I feel, it's a conflict of interest for her to be speaking to us in closed session. Once we get to that point where we're talking about going into open and close, and again, that's something separate. My motion is a little bit different than that. We can go there. But what are your thoughts about Alderman Susha speaking to us? 
I don't know, as the citizen hat or the alderman hat to us in closed session? Is that a conflict of interest? Thank you. Um, I guess my advice there is to the extent uh, Alderman Susha wants to be heard tonight, um, that if the council wishes to hear her, that should be heard in open session. Uh, I don't think it fits under the call of the closed session. Uh, conferring with legal counsel, who's rendering oral advice concerning strategy. I think it's it's basically the uh, explanation, perhaps, or clarification of the settlement offer um, that really isn't in the call for the closed session. Um, I guess number two, typically, you know, it's it's an awkward situation. Uh, you get uh, an older person who's um, also a named or establishment as a named party in a lawsuit against the city. Um, there, uh, and and one one of the issues that is in their settlement offer uh, is directly financial in nature. They're asking. Um, the plaintiffs are asking for their attorney fees to be reimbursed. That's a substantial sum of money that, uh, in effect, Alderman Susha is asking the council for. So, uh, you know, even outside of the financial, the, the whole nature of the litigation, uh, I think there's a conflict and uh, would advise Alderman Susha not to participate in the uh, discussion and the deliberation, uh, and especially not do so in closed session. I think to the extent the council, as I said before, uh, wishes to hear from Alderman Susha as to what she's got to say about the case or whatever, uh, I would I would say you could allow her to do that in open session if if you choose. But um, I, I I do see a conflict of interest uh, in uh, going much farther than that, other than you know, beyond uh, perhaps presenting some information. Any other discussion? Clarification on the motion. Clarification. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Would you like me to clarify on the motion? Well, if I understand it correctly, your motion is to <clears throat> prohibit Alderman Susha from speaking in closed session to us. And also, you wanted D. Olson to be able to speak with us. Correct. It's a two-part motion. Correct. And may I also ask that there would be a roll call vote on this issue? Yes, of course. Thank you. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that one of the things I need to bring to everybody's attention is that during my presentation, I will be talking about private citizens. I will be talking about city employees. And I will be also talking about some of the action of these city employees as well as high-ranking government officials within the state of Wisconsin and how they weigh in on this subject. And due to the fact that I think it's highly inappropriate to talk about other people like this in the public session, that is why I would request that you do this in closed session, and I'd be more than happy to leave during your discussion. Um, if you want to turn this into a media circus and have me say this in public, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But I just want you to be aware that there will be specific people named in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sushan. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I guess my question would be this. If we're um, going to allow Alderman Susha and D. Olson in open session, then shouldn't we allow everybody in open session and we only go into closed session to make our decision at the very end and confer with our legal counsel? I mean, if we're going to exclude Alderman Susha, then we need to make sure everybody stays out here in open session. It can't be she stays out and everybody else can go in. That, that wouldn't be right. So um, that would be my, my objection would be uh, if, if we're going to go into closed session, everybody. If we're going to stay in open session, it's everybody. It's one or the other, but not pick and choose because I mean, we have to afford her the same, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Well, the, the same, uh, you know, what you call it? You know, if uh, Susan Hundley wants to speak to us, shouldn't she speak to us in open session as well? Or are we going to allow Susan Hundley to go to closed session with us? That's what I'm getting at here. We can't say one is good for one thing and one's good for the other. That's not going to fly by me. 
Thank you, Alderman Radke. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Madam Chairman. All I want to know is, is Sue Huntley, I mean, uh, it's not Sue Huntley, I didn't even see her here. Uh, is Sue is going to be talking as a citizen or her alderman? <coughs> Uh, Alderman Susha, tell us. Um, you know, that's a fine line. You are a you citizen know, with information. You are an true. alderman with key information. That is true. That's why, honestly, I can't tell you which hat I'm wearing. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. A simple question for our city attorney. Hearing what Alderperson uh, Susha has mentioned, do you have any legal advice that would be helpful for us? Uh, <clears throat> not anything other than what I've indicated before. And when I indicated about the closed session, I think uh, you know you can discuss whatever you want in open session. All I'm talking about is to the extent. Uh, you want to discuss with me as your legal counsel strategy regarding the lawsuit, uh, I'd recommend that that be done in closed session. Uh, as far as conflict of interest, I think uh, Alderman Sush has got a conflict of interest on this. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, looking at the uh, League of Wisconsin Municipalities magazine from December 2002, that's it, a legal comment on ethics and conflict of interest rules for local officials and employees. Um, and I, I think there's clearly a conflict that public officials should not participate in or perform any discretionary act with respect to making, granting, or imposing an award, sanction, permit, license, contract, offer of employment, agreement, or other matter in which the official member of the official's immediate family or a business or organization with which the official is associated has a substantial financial interest or would gain a substantial benefit. Wisconsin Ethics Board guidelines for state officials suggest that when a matter in which a local official should not participate comes before a body which the official is a member of, the official should leave that portion of the body's meeting involving discussion, deliberations, or votes related to the matter. Um, when, because of a potential conflict of interest, an official withdraws from the body's discussion, deliberation, and vote, the body's minutes should reflect the absence. So, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, again, the, the closed session is to confer with legal counsel concerning strategy. Uh, there's been a settlement offer submitted. Uh, I guess I assume that uh, Ms. Susha wished to address that. I don't know, apparently she wants to... Uh, bring in other matters uh, that I'm not even sure uh, relate to the subject matter. Maybe they do. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what they are. But, uh, I still think if you allow uh, Alderman Susha to speak on this issue, I think it ought to be done in open session. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney McQueen. <laughs> Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think it's fair to say that um, this is a unique situation, and I'm sure it's uncomfortable for all of us. And and you are correct, Alderman Racky. We do not only wear hats as citizens, but also as older persons. But what's unique to this situation is that Alderman Susha has been a major decision maker in the legalities of this issue. So because, due to that conflict of interest, and I also took it upon myself to contact the State Ethics Board and, and ask them if an individual is going to abstain from their vote, how do, does that mean they can abstain from discussion? And the State Ethics Board said, the attorney there said, that there's no distinction between the two, that they're viewed as one is the, one of the same. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Dan Burr. Thank you. <coughs> the agenda as on there, we were going to discuss the lawsuit. Now, now all the person, Shusha, all of a sudden comes up with individuals involved, city employees and everything. Why weren't those issues 
gone through the proper channels before she came in here tonight. You know, that's another suggestion. Uh, sorry if I'm no, out. No, no, please. Um, you know, I don't know what Alderman Sushi's got to say, but if, if it does involve personnel issues involving city employees, that's another basis that you can go into closed session to discuss, but it's not noticed that way here. Um, and, you know, I don't know the timing of those issues or what, but uh, it's possible that that could be brought up at a subsequent meeting under an appropriately called closed session to address um, if it's issues concerning employees over which this body has jurisdiction, that's, that's an appropriate subject to discuss in closed session. But that's, it wasn't noticed that way because uh, I wasn't aware of it. Alderman Eldon Burke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I think a key issue then comes to the role that Alderman Shusha will be. Will she be Renee Shusha citizen or Alderman Renee Shusha? Because to what degree do we as a city bear liability for, some, uh, for a statement that an alderman may make uh, involving a city employee? I think it's clear that as citizens we, can, we have uh, largesse in making statements about many, many different things and many different uh, items as individuals. But if I were to speak as an alderman, to make very specific comments about a city employee, to what degree does that bind the city into any liability for my comments? Thank you. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I think um, if Alderman Susha wants to speak to us as Renee Susha, then she should go in the gallery and sit in the gallery and stay there for the rest of the night. She wants to speak to us as Alderman Susha, then she should sit in her chair and be Alderman Susha. I think that's, you said it's a fine line, I think that's the difference. This bar right here, that's the difference. So thank you. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. We now have the motion on the floor to not allow Renee Susha to speak in closed session. And the second part of the motion is to have D. Olson also give us some information. An I vote means Alderman Susha will not be allowed to speak to us in closed session. Call the roll. D. Berg. Aye. E. Berg. Aye. Serta. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. No. Radke. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Shusha. Abstains. Van Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Montemayor. No. Motion passes. You will not be allowed to speak in closed session. And D. Olson, you'll be allowed to give some information. Do you want to give us some information now? Do you not want to? <coughs> Discuss it first a little bit, and then I can respond. Or okay, some specific information later on. Thank you, Alderman Serda. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chairman. That's the recommendation that I made. Address them as they come. Thank you, Alderman Sir Susha. Do you want to, uh, as uh, Silas Vanderweel said, stand in the citizens citizens po citizens podium? What I would like to do is represent my constituent, Susan Hunley, as an older person, since she is the one that is going to be appealing this tomorrow morning. So I would like to continue to wear my aldermanic hat uh, in her representation. And she has given me the authority to do that. She did so earlier today. Alderman Manning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, given our city attorney's comments, uh, I feel like it might be appropriate to deal with the uh, proposal before us and not receive input this evening, uh, we might then defer a decision in relationship to the proposal to a later meeting at which we have closed session and private commentary that might include uh, employees of the city personnel issues. I would feel more comfortable with that. So that is my motion. You'd like to make a motion. Are there, is there a second to Alderman Manny's motion? Second. The motion has been made and seconded. 
that would you state it again, Alderman Manny, so we understand clearly? We discussed the proposal before us separately in private session as it deals with legal issues, relationship to a lawsuit in our council. And then we defer a decision if we feel duly, uh, that duly necessary to a later meeting at which we have closed session input from uh, Citizen Susha or Citizen Hundley uh, that concerns personnel issues that have a private nature that we can hear in a safe context. And um, that's the motion. Alderman Manny, are you saying to not have Renee speak here at all this evening? Correct. Is there any further discussion on Alderman Manny's? And that would include D. Olson as well. We deal with the issue before us as printed. If we're not ready for a decision, we meet again at a later date and invite the others to come and speak privately as necessary. Thank you. <clears throat> Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Considering all of the scheduling that had to take place, and I also questioned the time frame of calling this meeting, I think it's courtesy to everybody here that we address this issue tonight. I personally have spent hours trying to do my homework to address this situation tonight, and because of the information, and I have been forthright with Alderman Susha, her stance has not changed. We have communicated with Steve McLean. I think in all fairness, with this meeting being called as early as today, that I think we should proceed further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion on the motion? We'll do a roll call vote on Alderman Manny's motion. Do you understand? His motion is to not have Alderman Renee Susha speak at all this evening and not have D. Olson speak this evening and speak at a further time in a closed session. Eber, nay. Serta? Nay. Kittleston? No. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Radke? Aye. Sagale? Nay. Susha? Same. Van Akron? No. Vanderweel? No. Bauman? No. Eber? No. Montemayor? Aye. Nay, seven. The motion fails. Where do we go now? Alderman Sushan, you will speak in open session if you choose. Since I have it prepared, I might as well lay the cards on the table. Um, if it would be all right, I'd like to take a minute just to hand out a few documents. You choose to stand there to make it easier. Okay. Okay. package of colored documents. And what I'd like to do is just review a little bit of the history because it's difficult for you to take a vote on the issue if you don't know what's going on. Um, the first set of green documents is just a copy of the room tax statute. And one of the things that you will probably hear uh, throughout the course, just for clarification, is a 90-10 split versus an 80-20 split. And what that means is that um, if you turn to the second page of the green document, and uh, under number two, it talks about if a municipality collects a room tax on May 13, 1994, it may retain not more than that same percentage of room tax. On that date in 1994, the city of Sheboygan was retaining approximately 10% of their room tax uh, for administrative purposes, and 90% of the room tax was going to the Convention and Visitors Bureau for promotion and marketing. A little bit further down in that same paragraph, right after the letter A in parentheses, it says, the municipality shall spend at least 70% of the increased amount of room tax 
that is being collected after May 1st, 1994 on tourism promotion and development. Um, this is a, a difference of opinion. What, what, what um, Ms. Hunley and her attorney interpret this as saying is that any increase in room tax after May 1st, 1994 would be a 70-30 split. So prior to the state in 94, uh, Sheboygan was collecting 4% room tax and the split was 90-10. Since that date, we've increased it another 4%. And the way they interpret this is that the split should be 70-30 on that other 4%. So when you blend the two figures together and you're looking at 8% room tax, the blended figure, um, according to their calculations, is an 80-20 split. Um, this is just a, a minor issue, but um, I know City Attorney McLean reads this as saying, that whatever you were doing on that date in 1994, which was a 90-10 split, that's how it should stay. So I'm just making this as a point of clarification because you will hear 90-10, 80-20. Um, if you look at the next document, it's a peach color document. And this is um, from the State Department of Tourism in 2005. It just came out this month of May. If you look at the lodging component, it only accounts for 12% of the tourism dollars. The majority of the tourism dollars spent on shopping, food, and recreation. And the reason that lodging collects room tax is because we capture the true tourist. Um, most people that live in Sheboygan are not spending the night in a hotel. But people who travel to Sheboygan probably will sleep in a hotel um, while they're doing their sightseeing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the retail shops, the recreational activities, the restaurants, they don't understand that they're supposed to be the recipient of the room tax promotion. Lodging collects it but the recipient of the promotion should be anything related to tourism. Um, another good example is um, when you look at the marina in Sheboygan, um, this is not promoted enough. Room tax dollars could be used to promote it better. Um, Sheboygan has the lowest rate uh, as far as what we charge to people to dock here. We're lower than Manitowoc, Port Washington, and Milwaukee. So even though that we have a great marina, it's wonderful, it's inexpensive to dock your boat here, we are the only marina out of those four that I just listed that is not sold out. Plus, we incur, incurred $100,000 in ice damage this year. And it would be nice to have all the slips filled, which we could probably do with proper promotion, um, so the taxpayers wouldn't have this extra burden of the marina uh, sitting on their tax bill each year. So if we were to use the room tax money appropriately, form a room tax commission to make sure that the proper entities are being promoted, it actually would benefit the taxpayers of the city. If you flip to the next page, um, the blue page reflects uh, historical perspective as far as uh, how much room tax was collected each year and what percent was given to the Chamber of Commerce. And you can see from 1984 to about 1996, the city kept roughly 90%. In 1997, that's when um, the city started getting creative as far as what they defined as tourism. And if you look on the next page, the purple page, um, it shows you in 2002 how the money was dispersed. In 2002, we were, I believe, charging 6% room tax. And um, that's when the city decided to change the contract with the Chamber of Commerce. And rather than take a 10% or a 20%, they decided to take $150,000 off the top. And at that time, uh, we were collecting about $300,000 in room tax. And with the city taking the 150 off the top, you can do the math. It's a simple 50% basically was going to the city. Um, what uh, happened in 2001 is the English Manor and Lakeview Mansion Bed and Breakfast were contacted by the Chamber of Commerce, and they brought this potential change to their attention. The, that's how um, the Chamber asked basically for help. The reason they went to um, the Bed and Breakfast is because they were locally owned and um, you know the, the hotels aren't. So they asked for some help in trying to um, get an 80-20% uh, deal worked out with the city. And that's what kind of started this whole ball rolling. That's when the Sheboygan Lodging Group started meeting to discuss where the room tax is going. And you can see back then it was used for the Memorial Day Parade, the International Committee, the mayor took $10,000 to travel, um, Business Improvement District. A lot of the money went to the 4th of July Parade and the police overtime. Um, What's kind of strange is that all of these things that were going on in 2002 when we were collecting 300000 in room tax, the things that we said back then you could not do, you can do all of this today without any questions and without breaking any laws. The reason being is that with Blue Harbor in the picture and raising the room tax to 8%, we now bring in over $1.1 million in room tax. 
so the city can keep their 10% or 20% and use it for whatever they want. So this old issue of should you be using money for the police overtime, you could use all of the money for police overtime. You know, the rules have changed just over time because now we collect so much money. Um, one of the things I do want to point out, the quote at the bottom of the page, April 14, 2003, um, if you go back to that city council meeting, you will see city attorney Steve McLean saying, could a judge say that the use of room tax to pay police overtime for the 4th of July parade is stretching the bounds? Could be. That's a possibility I could conceive. So here you have a city attorney saying that the judge might say Sheboygan is stretching the bounds, um, but now you have to ask him if he can guarantee you a win at the appellate court. Because if you cannot get a guarantee win at the appellate court from Attorney McLean, then I suggest that you adopt the settlement. It is not outrageous. Forming a room tax commission is the type of check, checks and balance that the city really needs. If you go on to the white document, this is probably one of the most important documents in this entire packet. Um, if you look in the first column is the year. The second column is the guaranteed room tax that Blue Harbor guarantees that they're going to pay every year. You can see in 2005, they are going to guarantee about $700,000. What that means is if they only generate $500,000 in room tax, they have to pay the $200,000 difference. So if they raise more than $700,000 in actual room tax collected, they have to pay the actual amount that they collect. If you look at the, the middle column, it's an estimate. It's just the estimate on what the debt service is going to be. And this year, it's $150,000 is the payment that needs to be made on the debt, the $8.14 million that's being borrowed here. So then you see a column, number four, the difference column. There's going to be an excess of $550,000 this year in the room tax budget. If you look at the letter on the next page, um, we're going to go back to the white sheet. But this is a response I received from Mayor Schramm. And I requested um, information detailing exactly how all the room tax for Blue Harbor was going to be spent. And he wrote back, your first request is for a detailed description of exactly how all the Blue Harbor room tax will be spent. To the best of my knowledge, there is no such document. The public records law does not require an authority to create a new record to respond to a request. Therefore, this request is denied. I was never told where the difference was going because a written document does not exist. It does not. I've been over the development agreement. I've been over the amendment of the agreement. There is nothing in there that says this difference is going to the debt of the conference center. All it says is there's some phrase about it will be, uh, the money will be used to pay for public improvements and part of the conference center debt. It's, it's pretty vague, but it's not specific in any way. And if it was specific and it was in the development agreement, I would have not gotten the letter on the next page because it says that the public record does not exist. So. That's telling me that this difference column is still questionable where it's really going. So part of the settlement that's on the table before you is to take 100%, the entire guaranteed room tax that's generated each year, and each year put it all into the debt of the conference center. The sooner we get it paid off, the better for the city and the better for the tourism industry. So that is what one of the, the proposal is basically saying. Take that $700,000 this year, and stick it all into the debt of the conference center. Or there's nothing preventing you from saying, hey, the city wants to take 10% of the Blue Harbor room tax, and we're going to use it for administrative purposes. That's an option as well. There's nothing telling you what to do with that difference column. And the Chamber of Commerce entered into a contract with the city promising they would not touch the guaranteed room tax. They're not going to touch it. So right now, the Chamber of Commerce has responsibility for promoting the conference center they do not receive one nickel of the $700,000 a year that's generated by Blue Harbor. But yet they're going to promote it to the best of their ability with the limited resources that they are given. So just, we'll probably refer back to this page. I just want to keep moving along. Um, if you look at the purple page, I just, it kind of introduces the next document I'm going to go over. And it was sent to the aldermen September 16, 2004. And if you look at the top, you'll see that it lists the Sheboygan Lodging Group. And you'll see that there are multiple names up there. Um, this is something that Susan Hunley is not doing on her own. Or, or she's doing it on her own, but she's got the moral support of a lot of other hotels behind her. Um, and also, it's interesting to note that in this letter, it talks about, we also want to bring to your attention that the room tax contract between the city and the Chamber of Commerce will expire December 
31st, 2005, before you renew another agreement, you may want to consider other options. So that's telling you something right there. And I hope that if you do form a committee to do research into where the room tax money is going, that you also um, survey the hotels in the area and ask what their opinions are. Then the next document is an email that was sent from Attorney McLean to Don Norwich um, and copied to several other people relating to the Blue Harbor uh, contract. And it was sent out July 29, 2003 at 4.47 p.m. This was sent out the day before the development agreement was signed. If you turn the page and read the underlying part, when what he's talking about is paying for the conference center debt. The city's financing is general obligation debt of the city and not any form of special purpose revenue financing. As such, even under the worst case scenario, where the claimants prevail on the merits of their claims, such an outcome would have no effect upon the city's obligation to provide the funding for the convention center. What that means is that the convention center is guaranteed with the general fund. If the appellate court overturns the decision of Judge Langhoff, that means approximately $20 million will be dumped on the shoulders of the taxpayers. If you go back to that white page, you will see that over the 23 years of the schedule, the guaranteed room tax collected is $26 million, and the amount that would be applied to the debt of the conference center is $16 million. So this is the gist of why the settlement should happen tonight, because it's not going to be the English manor who appeals this. It's not going to be her fault if the $20 million gets dumped on the shoulders of the taxpayers. It's not going to be Mayor Perez's fault for allowing this to happen because he can't even vote on this subject. It's going to come down to the 15 aldermen that are sitting here today. If you are willing to take that risk of dumping that money on the taxpayers, you know, you have the opportunity when I leave the room to question Attorney McLean. And if he cannot guarantee you a win at the appellate court, then you better think long and hard about whether you're going to take that risk. Because what's being asked in the settlement is not that outrageous. Now, if you go to the next document, just to give you a little bit of a history, after the chamber um, brought to the attention of the Sheboygan Lodging Group that the city wanted to take more room tax money away from them, which ultimately hurt the promotion development of tourism, um, a room tax advisory committee was set up. It consisted of Mayor Schramm, Paulette Enders, uh, Bill Steffen, Juan Perez, and then you had representatives from uh, the Baymont, Brownstone Inn, and Lakeview Mansion. Ex officio were Rich Gephardt and Attorney McLean. At the same time we were meeting, um, there were secret negotiations going on between the city and the chamber. And the, the Sheboygan Lodging Group was screaming that we don't have, excuse me, representation. We don't have a say in where this room tax money is going. We'd like to be more involved in the process. At the same time, this whole contract was, was uh, swept away and um, the chamber basically kissed away all the money from Blue Harbor without consulting anyone else. So uh, this room tax advisory committee met approximately seven times. And at the last meeting, there was a motion made to, um, to redistribute the room tax money, where the lodging group felt more comfortable with where it was going. And um, the motion was seconded. There was some discussion. And um, just uh, there wasn't a roll call vote initially. And um, when Mayor Schramm said all in favor, half the room said aye, half the room said nay. So what Mayor Schramm did is he went around the room and he pointed to every single person that was sitting at that table, including the ex officio members, Rich Gephardt and Steve McLean. And they both weighed in with a vote, even though they were not entitled to vote. So just as the mayor says, motion denied, I said, wait a minute. You know, there were people that were ex officio here that voted. So the motion actually carried. And at that time, Mayor Schramm threw his pencil down and said, I refuse to take this to the council floor. This is where it all began. Had he taken the recommendation to the council floor, we would not be here tonight. We would have a room tax commission overseeing where the money is going, and we would have uh, a, a tourism that would just be skyrocketing. But unfortunately, we're not skyrocketing at this point. Um, if you flip to the next page, this yellow page um, also identifies some problems with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, it looks kind of like a goofy chart, but it's one of the important documents. This was handed out at a CVB meeting on November 6, 2002. 
Um, the first, year, first column represents the year. The next column is the total amount collected by the city. Uh, the CVB share would be the amount of money that the city gave to the chamber. Um, the CVB percent would be the percent that went to the chamber. Um, but then what's interesting is take a look at the column entitled CVB overhead. You will see that from 1999 to 2002, their overhead went from $85,000 up to $120,000. When this lawsuit got kind of rolling, the question was posed to the chamber, why did your overhead go up? And they refused to answer the question. When you look at the amount of money that was available for marketing, you can see in 1999 there was 113,000 available for marketing. By 2002, the marketing money was down to $37,000. If this isn't a big red flag in everybody's mind, it really should be. Um, I've added the numbers um, for 2003, 4, and 5, and you can see that Initially, I started talking about the 90-10 split or the 80-20 split. You can see that the money that actually makes it to marketing is way below. And when I say 90-10, 80-20, that 80 or 90% is what's supposed to be used for the promotion. And you can see that we are bouncing somewhere between the 12 to 36 percentage point over the last four years. We're far below that. And, and um, actually, if you want to... Skip ahead of, well, I guess I'll go in order just not to. You'll see what the ramifications of that are in just a second. Um, but as the room tax advisory panel kind of came to an end because um, Mayor Schramm never called another meeting, um, other people were getting involved. There were over 40 meetings where the lodging group was summoned to. But unfortunately, it was with so many different fractions. It was never the common council. And this is the governing body that makes the decision on where room tax goes. Um, you'll see that um, here we have a memo, the light blue page, from Mike Muth, and he's representing the Friends of Sheboygan. And if you go to the second page, um, if you read what I circled and I put a box around, it says, at the risk of speaking for the city, the mayor and his administration, the Chamber of Commerce and the Sheboygan Development Corp., the management of Great Lakes, the Friends of Sheboygan, and future generations of Sheboygan, I want to thank the hoteliers for agreeing to cancel the meeting scheduled uh, with the city for next Tuesday. There were people that were stepping in and acting like they had the power, and at the time we believed they did have the power to actually do what only this governing body can do. So we were sent on wild goose chases, but every step of the way we kept saying, um, I think uh, maybe I forgot to read two pages back on the goldenrod issue, you know, the Tourism Commission issue uh, had to be resolved by November 1st, otherwise Sheboygan Lodging Group was going to take further action. That was November 1st of 2002. This memo came in on February, uh, I think, uh, 14th or 16th, 2003. We still didn't have any resolution. So this went on and on. And by the time uh, April of 2003 rolled around, Ms. Hunley got a call from um, an important city official that said, you know, you keep talking about a notice of claim, and the proper process to notice a city that you're going to sue them is first you have to file a notice of claim. He said, you know, it would be helpful if you filed your notice of claim before we actually sign the development agreement because then we can straighten everything out and perhaps we can work all the, the differences out. So that's what she did. She got a lawyer, the, file, the claim was filed in April of 2003. And from there it was just kind of delay tactic after delay tactic. Uh, the lawsuit did come about six months later and um, eventually we wound up in court several times on some frivolous motions, and that is part of the reason that the, the attorney fee should be reimbursed. But on February 15th, I know that Alderman Van Acker was in court, and you can see on the red pages I underlined what the judge had to say about this case. It says, I wish I had the luxury of the Court of Appeals because they not only have probably a little bit more time to focus on the issues, they also have the support staff that are able to do the research for them. I realize that the decision of the trial court may not be the last decision made by this case by legal authority. In other words, it may go to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court because obviously it's a very interesting issue and from my perspective, it's a pretty close call. And then the last page, um, just a, a issue of this magnitude, or due to the magnitude of this issue, I will try to get you a written decision within 30 days, um, which is what he did. Uh, or shortly after that. And what I did on the yellow page is I included the last, 
page of his document, and it says the plaintiff's remedy, however, does not lie in the judicial arena. arena. Plaintiff's remedy lies in the state legislature. So what he was saying is that a judge, he didn't want to rule on this case, but what he recommends we do is go to the state and try to um, change the state statute. Well, uh, another thing to notice on here is that if the judge did not believe this was a close call, he would have assessed Susan Hunley court costs. There were no court costs, as you can see right below that underlying portion, there were no court costs assessed in this case at all. This is virtually unheard of. If he thought that she lost hands down, he would have assessed court costs. He still thinks that this is a close call, and you've got to keep that in mind. Do you want to dump 20 million on the taxpayers? So fortunately, about two weeks after this decision came out, the room tax statute was being discussed in Madison. And um, Susan Hunley was one of the people from Sheboygan that went down there. And Attorney McLean was there. D. Olson was there. And it's interesting to note the people that supported the change in the state statute. It would be the Wisconsin Association of Convention and Visitors Bureau. It would be the Wisconsin Association of uh, 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 Chamber of Commerce. The Wisconsin Innkeepers Association. You had Susan Hunley there representing it. The only Chamber of Commerce that was sitting on the other side opposing the change in the state law was the Sheboygan Chamber of Commerce. And she was sitting next to Attorney McLean. And Attorney McLean had been told, just like we were told, according to the judge, the remedy lies with the state legislature. So he was there opposing a change in state statute. So here you have a judge saying, go to Madison. We go to Madison. Then the most strange thing happened in the world. A couple weeks after that hearing, um, Susan Hunley was at a Wisconsin Innkeeper Association meeting. And at that meeting, the president of that organization, which represents about 13,000 hotels across the state, put a slide up to bring everyone in the group up to speed with what was going on in Madison relating to the change in the state statute. <clears throat> and she had a meeting that morning with the Secretary of Tourism, Jim Holprin, for the state of Wisconsin. And the Secretary of Tourism told her, gave her this uh, purple document, and um, at the end of the discussion, he said, it boils down to three points. You need to change your statute in three ways. Number one, eliminate the reporting requirement for municipalities, because the municipalities obviously don't want to report what they're really doing with money. Number two, eliminate the penalties to these municipalities. But the third point that had to happen, or Governor Doyle is going to veto this entire bill, is you need to create an exemption for the city of Sheboygan. And it was unclear if it was for all components or just the convention center project. So now this has evolved to the point where the governor is involved and we're supposed to be like an island and we're supposed to start asking for state exemptions. I think this has gone far enough. I think tonight is the night to settle this because this is ridiculous. And it's time to put it to rest. In fact, if you turn to the orange page, um, I talked to Representative Terry Van Akron yesterday and I thanked him for putting his letter in the beacon. And the underlying part that I put down here is Governor Jim Doyle clearly understands the importance of tourism in our state and as such has proposed increased funding in his 05 to 07 budget for tourism promotion and marketing. This is what it's all about. We need to increase the money in Sheboygan going to tourism promotion and marketing. And the next page tells you why. You know, a lot of the statistics that are thrown out, you're always looking at Sheboygan County, Sheboygan County. Just to put it in perspective, Kohler generates a lot more than a million dollars a year in room tax. You know, the Ostoff generates a lot of tourism over in Elkhart Lake. But when you look at the city of Sheboygan, the th three of the last four quarters, our room tax collections are down. Tourism is down. The only upswing was third quarter of last year, which obviously was when the PGA was held. You'd expect an increase then. But look at first quarter of this year. We're down 32%. This is what we've been talking about. If you keep cutting the tourism promotion budget, you're going to see a decrease in tourism. Maybe the rest of the county will be able to carry the tourism numbers and keep us as the ninth highest uh, tourism uh, county that people go to. But the city of Sheboygan is failing. And if we don't give somebody more money to promote the daylights out of Sheboygan and get people in our marina, and you need to get people to start going to Blue Harbor, get them going to the conference center. Let's
get this tourism commission formed so they can give suggestions on how we can get more people there. We're going to just keep sliding because the budget has been cut so much over the years. And that's what it's all about. We need to form the commission and take care of it that way. Um, if you look at the blue document, this is another thing that the commission needs to address. This is part of the invitation to the Republican convention that was recently held at the city-owned um, Blue Harbor Conference Center. On the left-hand side, you will see available area hotels. Three of the seven, I believe, that are listed do not even pay Sheboygan room tax. It is in the redevelopment authority that Blue Harbor has to market all hotels in the area when there's a conference in town. And when I called the Republican Party and said, where did you get this list? They said, Blue Harbor Resort, send us the list. And they're listing hotels that aren't even paying room tax here. So who's that benefiting? I mean, the more money generated in room tax, the more money the city can get from their 10 or 20% for whatever they take. But issues like this need to be addressed, and that's why a room tax or a tourism commission is really a good idea. Um, the next page, the two green pages, it's just another thing that you need to know. Look at the date, May 5th, 2005. Paul at Enders contacted all of the, the hotels and restaurants in Sheboygan. I thought her job was to develop the community, not market tourism. I mean, we've got to get more buildings on the South Pier project. That's what she should be focusing on, not taking the time to promote the city. And um, you know, it says, as you may know with the phone call you recently received from me, I am gathering brochures from all lodging establishments who wish to be included in the mailing. She's calling us, she sent us an email, and she sent us a letter. I compliment her for her thoroughness. However, I question who's directing her to mess with tourism. If she's going to start doing this, then I advise we start sending her to state conferences so she can get a thorough understanding of tourism. The only problem is, is we have so many people now. You've got the chamber slash CVB that are supposed to be doing the promotion for Sheboygan. Now we've got Paulette Enders on the city tax rolls also doing the promotion for tourism. Then we also have uh, Richard Meyer on the city tax rolls doing tourism promotion and development. And oftentimes, I've seen magazines, several of them, where the Chamber of Commerce takes out a quarter page ad. Two pages later, Dick Meyer takes out a quarter page ad both of them promoting Sheboygan, and they're both placed in the same, like Northern Chicago magazine. It's not a good use of money. We have too many people messing with the room tax money, and we need to funnel it to one group, and that's why it's imperative to go with, with um, a room tax commission. And then the second page of Paulette's um, memo is the bottom page. Uh, somebody recently picked up the ad that she's running in um, the Midwest Airlines magazine. So that's just for your information. I'm getting near the end. Thank you for bearing with me. The yellow pages, um, that might come at a different time. It's not part of the lawsuit. Very informa interesting information relating to how Manitowoc set up a visitor center. And that is something that Sheboygan needs to do. We need a visitor center right off the highway so we can start plucking the cars off the highway as they're driving by. I mean, some of these statistics that they throw out there um, I think in the first few months that they were open, they had 20, I'm not sure what the time frame is, 26,000 visitors, um, 85,000 visitors in two year time frame. They said one day alone last weekend in July, they had 600 people go through their visitor center. We don't have that. You know, they stop at McDonald's or they stop for gas and they keep going. We need to get a visitor center so we can take them right off the highway and get them to stay here and spend their money in our restaurants and spend their money in our shops. So that is kind of a, a very fast overview, if I haven't bored you or confused you. Um, the last document is, it kind of speaks to the question about why are, why are attorney fees being asked. If you look at the July 29, 2003 notice of claim that was sent to Susan Hunley, um, it says, please be advised that no lawsuit may be brought on this claim against the city of Sheboygan or any of its office officials, officers, agent, or employees after six months from the date of receipt of this letter. So basically, when you receive a letter like this from the city attorney, it basically tells you you have six months to file a lawsuit. So part of the process, when the lawsuit was filed, there were motions made that the notice of claim wasn't followed 
there was a violation with the notice of claim. So Milwaukee attorneys had to keep coming up here to go to court to talk about the notice of claim. This was simply a delay tactic and an attempt to financially drain Susan Hunley. So that's pretty much um, it. Just in closing, I have a few comments. Um, these are the reasons why you should really consider settling this and be done with this. Um, first of all, I'm sure that if you asked Attorney McLean if he could guarantee you win at the appellate court, the answer is going to be no. You cannot make that type of guarantee. The consequence of losing at the appellate court will dump about $20 million onto the taxpayers. Remember, Judge Langhoff never weighed in on the difference between a conference center and a convention center. This is a huge point within the lawsuit. If it is a convention center, you can use room tax for it. If it's a conference center, you can't. We have Blue Harbor Conference Center that we built. If you look in the Sheboygan phone book in the yellow pages, will you find Blue Harbor under convention center? No. It is listed under conference center. And then if you're on the edge not knowing what it is, look under banquet hall because Blue Harbor is listed under banquet hall. We did not build a convention center. The plaintiffs provided testimony from three experts on what a convention center is versus a conference center. Remember, Judge Langhoff never touched this issue. He just called it a facility. And the city and Blue Harbor did not provide any experts in their testimony, and they will not be allowed to add any in their case, because the way the case is now is the way it's going to the appellate court. Judge Langhoff clearly stated that this is a close and interesting case. As far as I can see it, um, the city might as well toss a coin to see which way it's going to go. Um, some might argue uh, that you'll be setting a precedence by ending this litigation now. This is a very unusual lawsuit. I will agree with Alderman Serta. She's right. This is a very unusual situation as a whole. But the thing to point out is that nobody is suing here for financial gain. Nobody is suing for damages for lost business. No one is suing for punitive damages. Whereas in a normal case that comes across the desk of an alderman, you know, a garbage truck hit my car, therefore I want, you know, not only my car fixed, but I want $50,000 because I twisted my wrist or something like that. There's no type of extra cost here. We're, look, we're just strictly here talking about partial attorney fees. And the attorney fees can be reimbursed out of room tax money. Uh, the reason they should be is because this lawsuit never should have happened. The lawsuit arose out of the stubbornness of the previous mayor who did not care about the promotion of tourism. And the fees escalated due to the city attorney making worthless motions in an attempt to drain us financially. It's common strategy. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that it's no secret that I was involved in the investigation of the way Mayor Schramm and City Attorney McLean misused the Blue Harbor legal fees. And I believe that, to a certain extent, Attorney McLean is letting his hatred for me cloud the advice that he will be giving this council. I cannot believe that he would recommend risking dumping $20 million onto the taxpayers when a very simple and logical settlement is on the table. This is the last time the council will see a settlement from the plaintiff. When she prevails at the appellate level and $20 million is dumped onto the taxpayers, you cannot blame her. She has bent over backwards to accommodate what's best for the city. You cannot blame Mayor Perez either because he can't vote. The decision of this case is simply in the hands of the 15 aldermen. They, or you guys, will be the ones responsible for the potential $200 a year increase on each citizen's tax bill if the settlement cannot be reached. Um, I want to thank you for your time, and just as a postscript, I think that it would be inappropriate for Dee Olson to be allowed to speak on the lawsuit. She's not a party to the lawsuit. And had Susan Hunley known that there would be discussion by people not involved with the lawsuit, she would have probably sent more people in here, too. However, I think that the, the motion made by Alderman Manny, the other resolution, um, that would probably be more appropriate for her to weigh in on. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Susha. Anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer. Oh, maybe, yeah. 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 Alderman Sagali. Thank you, Mayor, Madam Chairwoman. I guess what one of the things is that um, you're, you're saying that the city and the chamber has misappropriated the room tax monies. Um, they've spent it in ways that they shouldn't have. I'd like to have you justify in this lawsuit, how you can ask for attorney fees 
which I feel would be misappropriating the room tax dollars tremendously. So if you can tell me why you think it's okay to do that, and what the city was doing is helping with the July 4th parade, which to me is tourism, bringing in tourism, what's the difference here? Okay, first Thank of all, you. Certainly, first of all, the question relating to um, 4th of July and tourism. I don't think there's more than a handful of restaurants or shops that are open on the 4th of July. When tourists come to a, uh, an area, they want to do shopping, they want to eat, they want to do those types of activities, and the 4th of July parade does not really create uh, people here that are spending their money in the restaurants and the shops and, and the things like that. In regards to uh, using that for reimbursement, it's first of all, it's because the Chamber of Commerce has decided that they don't want $700,000 of the Blue Harbor room tax. They don't want it for promotion. You know, they've made that clear based on the contract that they signed with the city. So there is nothing stopping the city from using that money however they want. So that is an option to take it out of there. Remember, the city can use 10%, 20%, depending on how you divide up the state statute. The city can use it for whatever they want. So if they choose to end this and not potentially dump $20 million on the taxpayers, that's their choice. However, if you're not comfortable taking it out of room tax and you want to take it out of the general fund, see, I feel that would be more inappropriate, taking it out of the general fund, because that comes from the taxpayers. So this is a room tax issue, and it should be taken out of the money generated from Blue Harbor that the chamber does not want, or the chamber's contract ends at the end of this year. You could build the reimbursement into future um, payments from whoever is going to start managing the room tax after January 1st. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you. Uh, question for uh, City Attorney McLean. Room tax dollars and the projected difference between debt retirement and um, thus the difference available for us to supposedly use. How much latitude is there? I believe the dollars for 2005 were in the $500,000 category. How much latitude do we have with those dollars? Um, you're speaking of the uh, Blue, Harbor room, Blue Harbor room tax dollars? My memory was that we were, of course, the agreements changed, you know, so it's hard to keep them distinct historically. Uh, but there was going to be, a, at least at one point in time, money put aside when there was an overage in the room tax dollar receipts. For those years following, there might have, might have been a shortfall. Um, that's not the case now under the development right. agreement. Okay. I mean, Good. The, uh, the guaranteed room tax amount that Blue Harbor is required to pay to the city, that is a number pulled out of the air. It's not tied to the actual room tax. Uh, they have to pay under the law, they have to pay the actual room tax on the rooms. The guaranteed amount is, could be more than they actually generate in room tax. To the extent that it is more than they actually generate in room tax, then there's a provision for, or for possibly refunding the overage, the guaranteed amount over the, over the uh, paid out actual room tax amount. Now that, I think the amendment though took, took that out of there. So there's no provision for payment of room tax shortfalls currently. So then we have latitude in some measure, but tell me to what measure do we have latitude to direct the $550,000 to further promotion, et cetera, et cetera? That's, right now, that's the council's prerogative. So, and, okay. and I would advise that that's in, should be in consultation with Rich Gebhardt, the finance director, as far as, uh, I'm not sure for 05 how much is in the budget to be set aside for debt retirement for this year. But uh, that's really a, a council, as it currently stands, a council decision each year. Thank you, Alderman Manning. Okay. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Madam Chair. I got one question for Renee. Are you appealing it or are you out of appeal? 
I am not appealing this. No, Susan Hunley from English Manor will be the only person listed on the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion? Any more comments? Um, yes. Madam Chairman, if I could just ask Alderman Susha just a question of clarifying. It's, it's on Alderman Manny's resolution, and I don't know, maybe Alderman Manny can address this, but there's one, uh, where is it here? Thank you. One uh, whereas provision there, uh, those responsible for bringing suit against the city are willing to drop the suit if a special study committee is appointed to fairly look at all the issues involved in the expenditure of the room tax dollars and the contract with the chamber. Is that? May I address? Yes, please. I have two amendments to the document. Oh. One is changing those oh. words, okay. are willing to maybe willing. And then I have one resolution at the end, which will be verbalized later, which deals with some amount of... Uh, uh, attorney's fees uh, reimbursement. Does that answer your question? Uh, not totally. Perhaps I could ask Alderman Do you have a position on that about the, the creation of a study committee um, under Alderman Manny's resolution? Well, as you know, tomorrow's the deadline for filing the appeal. So she will be filing the appeal. And um, I think the study committee has to happen. But you, you really have to talk to her as to if she would drop it just strictly on that. Um, just because a resolution is passed, I don't know. Thank you, Alderman Susha. Thank you, Alderman Manny. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Dennis, you look so puzzled. Did you want to say something? Matter of fact, yes. <laughs> Alderman Bauman. Well, anyway, I have to apologize. I. Um... I uh, may look a little flustered tonight, but uh, I'll try to get through this as easily as possible. In the beginning of the presentation by uh, Alder Person Susha, she had mentioned money about money to the marina for advertising purposes. As part of their contract, which I was digging through my drawers and found, um, they're being paid this year for the marina $63,654 for administration fees, basically. Part of their marketing agreement, which is on page three of the agreement, states that uh, they will commence, uh, uh, let's see here. They understand and acknowledge that uh, achieving and maintaining optimum uh, occupancy levels is crucial to the success of the marina and the satisfactory performance on this agreement. Uh, Skipper's initial marketing campaign will include boat shows, direct mail, advertising, public relations, commissions, sales, and a customer satisfaction assurance program. So they do their own marketing, basically, is the way this contract is set up. Thank you for the information, Alderman Bauman. Any other discussion? If not, we'll move on to Alderman Manny's resolution in a moment. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think we forgot part of my motion, and that was courtesy to D. Olson. And this, and you feel this is when she wanted to speak? If we're, okay, if we're staying in open session, that's fine. Yes. And if, yes. if Manny wants to pursue, she can wait till the end if she Yes, we are in open you. session. Okay. We are in open session. Alderman Manny, will you proceed with the information about your resolution? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I do want to add uh, two amendments to my resolution. Uh, the first is the whereas clause, as uh, Attorney McLean was noting with a little bit of uncertainty, this would be the last whereas clause prior to the first to be it resolved. And that is the last word on the first line uh, following city R, that word would be scratched and to be replaced by the words may be. So those bringing suit against the city may be willing to drop, et cetera. Then, in addition, one additional resolution to be added at the bottom. <clears throat> uh, it reads as follows, and there is a copy there for recording secretary. Uh, the city will pay $50,000 of the plaintiff's $100,000 legal bill from the 2006 through 2008 room tax dollars. 
to be paid in three annual payments on June 1st of each year, with 3% simple interest being added on each of the payments for 2007 and 2008 on the outstanding principal, comma, if they drop their suit. So I'll I move those amendments. Alderman Manny, do you want those amendments regarding the money it, as part of the um, accepting or not accepting of the study committee? No. Here's the deal. If the first proposal resolves the case, the situation, then we would uh, delete several whereases and a couple of resolutions from my proposal. If, in fact, the first proposal does not resolve the issue, if that's voted down, it or any other amended version of it, then my proposal stands firm and complete as it is to be dealt with accordingly. So we need a study team, I believe, regardless. Um, but it depends upon, uh, I'd be willing not to do this if in the earlier agreement I have an amendment to suggest a change in the numbers of those on the Tourism Commission, and then I would be happy with that as a way to go. So it's, there's nuance depending on what happens with the first proposal. Now your, this resolution proposal this evening, we as a council may make a recommendation, but it won't be voted yes right. or no until it goes right. to the council. Right. So now we, are, we have your resolution and we're talking about amendments how do we get the amendments here? Because we're not going to vote to amend here in a committee of the whole. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think the proce procedure would be to place the resolution on uh, for for passage by the committee of the whole, and then uh, assuming it's seconded, then make a motion to uh, amend the document. Um, and vote on those amendments. Um, and you do it all at one time, all the amendments at once, or each amendment, each individual time. Steve, can we vote to pass a resolution in Committee of the Whole? I thought we could only do a recommendation. Right, right. You'd be... Recommending. You'd be recommending okay. that the council pass the document as amended. Yeah. Okay. Alderman Manning. Thank you. Uh, just procedural question. Don't we want to deal with the first proposal first and have a sense of the uh, committee's perspective and recommendation to the council? Before you amend? Before we deal with that uh, resolution that I have to the body. Seems to be a discussion whether okay. and probably in closed session with some of these issues would give us greater sense of clarity about that proposal, a response to it. Therefore, any discussion in relationship to my resolution would be much more appropriate and succinct. Okay, we have it straight that we vote on the resolution. Yes, Eldon Berg, Vice President, give me a little help. I believe that uh, Alderman Matty would like to hold uh, his resolution pending our consideration of RO 570506, which will be are considered, I believe, in closed or open session, depending upon the pleasure of the council. Is that correct? Correct. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Eldenburg. That's going to be held for voting until after our discussion in closed session with Attorney Steve McQueen. Uh, any further discussion? I will entertain a motion to go into closed session under the exemption provided in section. Sure. Alderman Berg. Okay. E. Berg kind of hit the nail on the head. I was going to say we had two documents here tonight, and all of a sudden we haven't taken care of one yet. We're jumping into the second one and, stake, and starting to make amendments. Why don't we make everything plain and simple? Take one at a time and get it out of the way.
I think Alderman Berg, before we can take an action on the First Amendment, we'll have to go into closed session to have the discussion with Attorney Steve McLean, right? That's what I'd recommend, right. <clears throat> I want a roll call vote on that then. Okay. Alderman Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think before we would make a decision and moving into closed session, we still have to take care of Dee Olson and give her that courtesy to speak, and then we can move forward to see where we're gonna go at. Thank you. I haven't heard a word from Dee Olson. She's trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dee Olson, did you wanna speak about resolution number 570506? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I want to, to speak, basically, I'm not going to um, come in here, you know, to talk about the lawsuit. That's not what I'm here for tonight. I'm here because the Chamber has been the entity that has done the promotion for tourism for many years. And we have done so, I think, in a very qualified way. And our back was up against the wall a number of times over the last few years. There was a point when we were receiving 90-10 split, which was um, the best of all worlds, I think, when it comes to tourism promotion. But we would not be sitting here with a Blue Harbor project if we had not made some concessions we didn't just dump the tourism money. We saw a vision that will help develop this community further. And we talk about, um, you know, how the city of Sheboygan is losing, losing gain on the room tax dollars. Um, that will change with the Blue Harbor being here. And uh, I want to make those comments clear. But the Chamber has, has been that uh, tourism entity, and I want to reference for you in the Wisconsin State Statute, Statute 6671 that deals with uh, governing bodies uh, dealing with room taxes, and it says under 6671, Section 1F defines a tourism entity means a nonprofit organization that came into existence before January 1, 1992, and provides staff, development, and promotional services for the tourism industry in a municipality. That would be the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. In addition, under the same section, sub B1, if a single municipality imposes a room tax under paragraph A, which basically says you are allowed to do that, <clears throat> the municipality may create a commission under paragraph C. The commission shall contract with another organization to perform the functions of a tourism entity if no tourism entity exists in that municipality. We do exist. And that means that if a tourism commission is formed, this section of the legislation provides for us to be that tourism entity. And I want to make that clear to the council. We have, we have worked hard to grow tourism. And I, I sent a memo to all of you because we had had a visit from, from Ms. Huntley with regard to their settlement agreement and wanting to garner the Chamber's support for, for that settlement agreement. And I met with her at length and we talked about a lot of things. But more importantly, she said that we would be the group that we would be contracted with by the Tourism Commission. She can't say that on behalf of the Common Council. That is your decision to make. You will decide if you want to continue to contract with the Chamber 
as you have in the past or whether you want a tourism commission. The tourism commission will be a, an entity in itself that is separate from the council and will then have the authority over those room tax dollars, taking that authority out of the hands of the common council. And they can report to you um, with what they are doing with the dollars. From the chamber's perspective, we feel we managed the dollars very well. And we did see an increase in some of the costs relative to the operations, um, the administrative costs, if you will, for running the tourism component of the Chamber of Commerce. We do economic development. We, we do legislative things. We do um, educational programs. And we do the CVB activity. We have been commendable in keeping our rep records separate. And you will hear from us again because we've requested floor time on June 6th to give our annual report out to the council on, you'll see the financials, you'll see <clears throat> information on how we do the marketing, where the dollars get spent. Um, we have grown tourism here in the last six years for the county. And one of the points I'd like to make is that while Room tax dollars are extremely important to us. We couldn't do the job that we do without them. We are a destination. And we can say, you know, our rooms are filled all of August. But they're filled because of Elkhart Lake races. We are more than just, people don't say, I'm going to go on vacation and I'm going to just stay within the confines of the city limits. They see Sheboygan County as an area that they want to visit. As a result, in order for us to be successful in bringing people to our area, we need to promote all of the amendments that are available to us, all of the things that people are looking for. And that is what we have been about. And uh, as a result, uh, our tourism has grown, not only taking us in the last six years from number 14 out of 72 counties to number 9 out of 72 counties. We have almost doubled the amount of dollars that are being spent here in Sheboygan County. We've gone from $134 million to $271 million plus. <laughs> but that is almost doubling. That is almost unprecedented in this kind of industry during what was a really tough economy, given 9-11 and some of the other things that have taken place. And part of that is, you know, Kohler does have a million dollars in room tax. Kohler spends their dollars on tourism promotion. We need to spend our dollars on tourism promotion. We complement one another when we are doing that kind of marketing for the area. So our rooms get filled because Kohler is marketing as well, because they are drawing people to the area. And uh, we are seeing the results of that. So I, I want you to keep in mind that as you go about a study committee, you know, there is a proposal for a tourism commission as you have seen it, there is no representation from the chamber or the CVB on that commission, although we're the promotion entity. You're talking about putting together a study committee. I've not heard us referenced as a component of that study committee. And I really think that we need to be a part of this process. We are in partnership with you. And we have an accountability back to you to let you know what it is we are doing, and we do that based on our contract um, that will be coming up. But um, the other, the other, probably the last parting thought is Renee said we need a visitor center. She is absolutely right. We do need a visitor center. We have been working on this for the last three years, trying to find a site. Property out near the interstate is not easily accessible. And when you do access it, it's very costly. And we have an accepted offer on a piece of property at this time. We are doing a little bit of due diligence. And if all goes well, 
our closing date is already scheduled for June 30th. Now this was in the works for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> we are proposing to do that without room tax dollars. We believe that the room tax dollars need to be used for marketing purposes. We've always done that with the exception of the administrative costs. And I'm sorry, but Denny's been with us 13 years and he deserves a raise for doing a good job. And as we have grown tourism, the demands on our time at the office have been increased and much more strained. We do time allocation reports at the office. I do mine as well. And we have two other entities that we contract for administrative services, the Sheboygan Development Corp and the, the Safety Council. And so if you're working on Safety Council, you allocate how much time you put to that. If you're working on SDC stuff, you allocate how much time. I want to tell you, the vast majority is with the CVB. Because when we place an ad in Midwest Marketing and we get their disk in, we have 4,000 packets in two days to get out of our office. And I've got three people who have to stop doing what they're doing and get those out because I believe that our tourists want a quick turnaround on the information they're getting. You know, the complications of how we operate and all of the things that we do is unknown to many. And I think that perhaps we need to identify some of that for, for the study committee because if they could assess the amount of manpower that is put into our tourism promotion efforts, it's not just taking the ad out, that's the easy part. The hard part is when you get the response to the ad and making sure we're directing those people and including in the packets the information that they're requesting that will adequately take care of their needs while they are visiting us. So we are doing a phenomenal job with what we are given. And I want to tell you, if we are given more, we will be that much happier because we can continue to do a great job for the city. And uh, we would like to be a part of that study committee if that component advances. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dee. Perhaps you missed part of the Be It Resolved because it says here, Alderman Manny, that the mayor's appointees include two representatives from the Bed and Breakfast Association, two representatives from the tourism industry, three council members, and two members from the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Maybe you just missed the, that whereas on there. Okay. I'll... Thank you for your information. Thank you. I would welcome any questions if there are any. If and when I... the study um, committee is formed, we definitely would like your input. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I want to direct this question to you, Olson. Um, the question I have is you stated some state statutes there, and pretty much that statute said your group is it. There is no other group that we could go to. In the, is that the way I'm reading there is, it? Well, there is, I guess if you would take a percentage, there's the bid district, but they're not representing the municipality in its entirety. They represent a small downtown district. So in the city of Sheboygan, no, there's no other entity that's really doing complete tourism promotion. And a chamber of commerce and a CVB are typically where the public will turn when they are looking for that type of information. Okay, and the follow-up to that is, though, you're the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. Now, the question is, define the municipality. I mean, you're a Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. Does that mean as a city we couldn't do our own thing because you're out there representing the whole county? or because we are in the county, you automatically are it. I mean, well, we were a city chamber before we were a county chamber. We, we are, consider ourselves the city's chamber. Okay. Uh, but we recognize that if you are drawing industry to an area, if you are drawing tourists to an area, if you are relocating people to an area, which is what we do, they aren't necessarily going to say, I'm just going to stay in, in, in the city limits. So we recognize that by marketing ourselves as a destination with all of these amenities and all of the abilities that we have here as an area, that we are much more successful in doing that. Being Taking us from rank number 14 to number 9 put us in with all of the big boys. 
in tourism. Wisconsin Dells, Lake Geneva, Milwaukee, Dane County, Green Bay with Lambeau Field. Um, you know, we are, we're there. We want to beat out the Fox Cities yet, but we'll continue to work on that. But we are, we are, um, we are definitely doing a, a good job marketing, but it's based on that philosophy. Uh, we could send out information on just the city, but it might not be enough to get them here. And we're here to get their dollars in, because that's what's going to continue to fuel the economy. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Appreciate the question. Thank you, Dee Olson. Thank you, Alderman Radke. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just also have a question for Dee Olson. If you could just expound on the rapport that you have um, with some of your clients that you work with um, in marketing the city of Sheboygan and highlight to the state and how you had received that contract. I think it's important that the older persons know that just how much actual work goes into this and that we are getting a Cadillac service with the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Well, one of the things that we are and believe in as part of our destination marketing is developing partnerships. And uh, Denny is a part of the Harbor Towns Group, for example, which are all the communities along the shoreline, eastern shoreline of, of Lake Michigan. And they have done some co-marketing and co-promotion where you benefit by pulling, you know, pooling dollars to maximize the benefit that you get out of those and then marketing those to other areas. In addition, with the state, we do gem grants. And the state is very uh, specific in who they award their gem grants to. And it didn't used to be this way. There used to be a time when a community was putting on a festival and you could write an application for a GEM grant, which is a joint effort marketing grant, and that community would get the grant. But now they have changed their philosophy, and they are promoting destination marketing initiatives where they're seeing um, some pooling of funds and some partnerships to help promote tourism. And one of those uh, examples would be our Lake to Lake Arts program, which is um, Fond du Lac, Manitowoc, and Sheboygan County working together to promote in the Chicago area all the cultural events and programs that are here, the performing arts as well as the museums and uh, the art center, for example. And those are packaged and put out there, um, and those are uh, joint efforts as well. But one of the things that we found was when you work within the industry for a long time, as Denny has done, um, he has developed some great relationships with many of the publications that we advertise in to the point where they will pick up the phone and call Denny and say, hey, you know, this is, a, this is the publication, this is its purpose, does it fit your needs because we have a, we have a spare, you know, page to fill with advertising and we're going to give you a half percent rate if you can come along with that. So those kinds of things take place because of the relationships that we build. And as a result, we get to maximize our dollars a lot further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, D. Olson. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you represent the county, the chamber. Right. Do the other county lodgings pay an 8% um, bed and breakfast or tax? No. No, each municipality, whether it be a town, a village, or a city, under the state statute, has the authority to decide for themselves whether they are going to impose a room tax or not. Okay, so yeah. the room tax for Sheboygan County lodgings only work in the county, or in, the, in Sheboygan, and the county doesn't pay anything? The county isn't allowed to tax. Okay, so you're... The county does provide... Um, about just short of $20,000 to help out of their general purpose revenue. So they don't have a collection me mechanism, but they provide that to the CVB just, I think, pretty much as a courtesy because they see the value in what we're doing, even though they don't have, have a, the county can't establish a room tax under the state statute. So it's controlled pretty much by state statute. Alderman Susha. Thank you. Um, I believe that the Chamber Board of Directors has roughly 25 to 30 people on it. And I'm just wondering if you could explain why 
there has never been a, a lodging person from the city of Sheboygan that is paying room tax that directly goes to you, why hasn't there been any representation from the lodging industry allowed on your board of directors when some years you have five people representing the banking industry and still you have zero from lodging? Could you please explain that? You more? said haven't been allowed. They would certainly be allowed. We, we have a very diverse board and of course all types of industries cannot be made up. But who is ever chairman of our CVB advisory board is always on our board so we have the link with the advisory board back to the chamber board and they are asked to report out at every single chamber board meeting. So there is a connection and we do have representation on our CVB advisory board from city lodging establishments. Thank you. Um, Alderman Berg, action on the report of officer or the resolution is number six on our agenda when we return from closed session. Does that explain? Explain that again. Number six on your agenda is the possible action we'll take on the RO and the resolution. And number six is after we reconvene again in open session. Does that answer your question? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I would now entertain a motion to go into closed session. Alderman Radke. Madam Chairman, I make a motion to move into closed session. Do I? Thank you. Roll call vote. Roll call. Yes. Okay. Roll call to go into closed session. Serta. Nay. Kittleston. Kittleston. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Radke. Aye. Sagali. Nay. Susha. Abstain. Van Akron. Nay. Vanderweel. Aye. Bauman. No. Deber. No. Eber. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Seven eyes, five nays. Closed session. We're going to closed session. So we'll all. I think that's a wonderful idea. Let's take a five minute break. Eberg. Here. Eberg. Here. Serta. Here. Davis. Oh, excused. Thank you. Rob. Excused. Kittleson. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Sigali. Here. Stefan. Excused. Susha. Abs here. Yeah. Here, yes. Ben Akron. Here. Vanduit. Here. Quorum is present. Quorum is present. Okay. We're out of closed session. What is your pleasure regarding RO 570-506? Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would move um, that that RO would be placed on file. Second. We have a motion and a second that this RO 570506 be placed on file. That would be a recommendation. A recommendation. Absolutely. Rec only recommendation to the council. Any discussion? Okay. We will have a roll call vote about the recommendation to the council. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Radke. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Susha. Stay. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderbilt. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Deber. Aye. Eber. Aye. Serta. Aye. Montemayor. No. Bush to file cabinet. Thank you. We'll move on to the next. Excuse me, ah. Kittleson. Aye. <laughs> so the recommendation to the council is that we file this document. And we'll address that at our next 
council meeting. What is your pleasure regarding resolution 290506, Alderman Manny's proposed resolution? What is your pleasure regarding the recommendation to council? Alderman Manny. Thank you. Um, given our conversation and our decision about the previous document, uh, we might want to change this document more than I had previously um, suggested by way of amendment. Did we formally have those, the whereas and the resolution changed and added for those previously clearly done? On our committee of the whole, do we have to vote on the amendments? Should put the document on the floor first. Okay. I would then uh, move this document. Be, uh, Sent on to council with recommendation. We have a motion and a second to move this document to the council with the amendments. Well, or with, not, not without no, any, with, with, without just as it is. As now, is. and then could, uh, amend it on the council floor if you want to. It's a <clears throat> we're voting whether we want to recommend to the council to consider Alderman Manny's proposal. Any discussion? Alderman Serda. Oh, Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I cannot support, um, so I will be saying nay to this. However, um, I don't mind sharing with Alderman Manny some of the revisions that could take place with this document. And so just currently as it stands, I'm going to be voting nay to it. So. Alderman Danberg. Thank you. Yeah, I too, I can't uh, support this because as long as we've had this Chamber of Commerce contract and everything, everything has been going along fine and dandy. Now we want to create another bureaucracy which the mayor did away with the ergo because he thought there was too much. And now we want to create more people getting in the mix I think the council has been doing a good job over all these years, and so has the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Alderman Burke. Remember, this is to create a study committee to see if we want to create a commission. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Alderman Manny. Thank you. Um, by way of amendment, before further discussion, formally, we would like to change the wording in the last whereas from are willing to may be willing. Thank you. And currently, as printed, uh, even though prior there was a verbalized resolution that included reimbursement, uh, at this point in time, that is not added. So as it's stated at this point in time, and I'm going to leave it that way at this point in time uh, for the committee's uh, recommendation and the, and the decision that essentially it's directed to the study, special study team. That I think is important to bring all those together at the table to reevaluate because uh, we don't well do this year by year. Um, it's something that those who are involved distinctly in the industry have much more knowledge about than we do. Therefore, to bring all the parties to the table, this meets the long-term good of the whole city. It meets the uh, concern of those uh, parties who have been plaintiffs. It includes the chamber. It doesn't do anything vis-a-vis -vis legal fees uh, as currently stated. Therefore, we have, uh, as a city, uh, in the flavor of the council, perhaps uh, opinion, protected dollars, but at least we're looking at long-term issues that have been historically felt and powerfully felt. If we do nothing else except look at those, I think we owe that to the whole city. Alderman Manny, uh, because the, 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 the agreement with, with the chamber is we have to decide yay or nay by the end of June. This would be a short-term study committee. Correct. Thank you. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
just due to the amendments and so forth with this document, even though um, I'll be voting against it, um, Alderman Manny, at any time you can bring this forward, maybe with the amendments, and that way we can have more clarification. We can have a hard copy and then explore it in the future. So we don't have to necessarily jump the gun tonight. So even though I'm voting nay to this, it could still be explored in the future. Thank you. Um, procedurally, uh, should I have a second for the amendment? I don't know if somebody's seconded it. We need a second for the amendment, and the amendment is to change the word are to maybe. Thank you. Now we will be voting on the, re the recommendation. I think the, the just, composer can... Just the amendment. Please. Just the amendment? Okay. All in favor of the, the amendment, aye. 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 Oh, oh. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Contrary. No. Contrary. Yeah. Thank you. We're changing the word from R to maybe. That was the vote on what we're doing right now. Now we will have a vote on how we will recommend. If we will, yes, Eldon Burke. I would uh, offer one other amendment. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the back, where it says, be it for the result that the mayor's appointees include two representatives from the Bed and Breakfast Association, two representatives from the tourism industry, uh, three council members, and two members for the Chamber of Commerce. I, I don't know that there is a Bed and Breakfast Association. I think there is a Hotel Years Association. And given that we have approximately 1,000 uh, rooms, the Bed and Breakfast industry should be represented, but I believe their proportion of rooms is probably 15 to 20 in the total mix. Uh, so I guess... We could change it to the lodging. And I would make that amendment. The amendment would be to change the words bed and breakfast association to lodging yes. association. Second. There's been a motion and a second and the amendment of changing the word bed and breakfast association to lodging association. Any discussion on the amendment to change those words? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. no. We understand it. We'll now proceed to, yes? Could, uh, identify how the vote, I mean, how, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, it passed. Okay. It passed. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. We'll now vote on Alderman Manny's resolution to create a study committee. Remember, our vote is simply recommending to the council. Any further discussion? Anybody else uh, want to say anything? Just, Madam Chairman, if I could, uh, one clarification on Alderman Manny. Uh, you've got on the next to the last, be it further resolved, I had circled that part at the end. Committee will report back to the council before the end of June's recommendations concerning the Chamber of Commerce contract and the expenditure of 2006 room tax dollars. Uh, you know, you really wouldn't have, I'm not sure if you're talking about the budget for next year for the room tax dollars. I don't know if you'd need to necessarily do that by June. Uh, uh, but you're, you're correct in that we're going to move on tonight about that which we do need to communicate to the chamber by June 30th. Right. So um, I would offer another amendment to change those words from what they are to remind me which one it is. To be a further resolved? The next to the last be a further resolved, yeah. <clears throat> okay, that the committee will report back to the council before the end of June with its initial um, recommendation concerning the renewal of the Chamber of Commerce contract. Period. In other words, all we need to say it won't be exactly as in the current form if that's right now. Change the word. Um, Insert initial. Initial. I knew I wrote that, but I couldn't read my own writing its initial recommendation concerning the renewal of the contract with the chamber and then cross out expenditure of 
2006 room tax dollars. Correct. Any, Correct. Everybody understand this amendment? We've got one amendment after another amendment after another amendment. Mm -hmm. Right. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yes, yes, Alderman Vanderbilt. You may talk. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, it's court after 10 at night. We've amended this like 10 times. Let's file a document. Alderman Mann, you bring a new one in to council, and then let's talk about it then. We can, we can amend this all night, and it's just not going to happen. <laughs> That's right. It's just too much. Thank you. I'll make a motion to file. Yes, we have the motion to, to um, yes, we have to, we have to resolve this motion before we can go with your motion to file. Right now, we have Alderman Manny's motion to change the wording in that last, that second last paragraph. Do we have a second on that amendment? Second. Second. Any discussion on that amendment? Alderman Ben Akron. I got a question on that. <laughs> don't we have that already in there that if we don't do it by the by the thirtieth, that it will stay the same, or we got to notify them that we have to change it, and why are we doing it again? Um, the lang the language in the contract, contract. says it, it terminates at the end of the year, but we have to give them notice by the end of June. If we don't want to renew it as it is, right. Uh, so that's what you got, and that's what you're trying to change. No, they're they're deleting. You know, the end of June isn't very far off. As far as the number of meetings you're going to be able to have, it's not that many. But the original language talks about the expenditure of 2006 room tax dollars. I I read that as basically coming up with a budget for 2006, yeah. and yeah. I don't think you're going to have the time to do that. And I don't. It really doesn't need to be done by the end of June. And remember, the study committee has to be finished by the end of June. It's, it's a short-term study committee. Yes? Just a question for the city attorney. Put the mic on there. For uh, clarification purposes, so we have to tell the chamber by the end of June whether we're going to renew the contract or we're going to change the contract. So if we come back in July or August and say, you know something, we're not. We're just going to leave it as is. That's totally acceptable that way? <coughs> we're getting at. So we say, well, okay, fine. The contract has been fine all this time. We're going to give you the same deal we had all this time. That's acceptable? Just the June 30th gives us a, 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 the opportunity to still change it after that? Uh, if, if we don't provide notice to the chamber by the end of June that we want to either renegotiate it or terminate it or change it in some respect, then it will automatically renew for 2006. What I'm saying is if we tell, tell the chamber we want to change it, but then in the long run we don't end up changing it, that's fine too, isn't it? Well, I would think that the chamber would probably <coughs> wouldn't have a problem with that. Yeah, so. Alderman Meyer. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, does the motion to file take precedence over any other motion? I'm just going to check. You may be done for. Thank you, Alderman Meyer. Mine is on here. Just wait. You can push the button on your desk, too. Oh, okay. I'm still on, too. Um. You sure are. Yeah, now you're not. Everybody's on. Postpone indefinitely, which is file, is that's the last uh, in the pecking order. So uh, adjourn, lay on the table. The previous question has precedence over to postpone indefinitely. So, so the the uh, the motion on the amendment would take precedence over postponing indefinitely, which is filing. Well, here we are, amend. That's number seven. So that's ahead of postpone indefinitely. Thank you, Attorney McQueen. So now, any discussion on the last amendment? 
<laughs> which is, in the be it further resolved, the mayor's appointees include two representatives from the lodging industry, two representatives from the tur tourism industry, three council members, and two members from the Chamber of Commerce. I think and we won't do that on. one again. Yeah. The committee, it would be the be it further resolved that the committee will report back to the council before the end of June with its initial recommendation concerning the renewal of the Chamber of Commerce contract. <laughs> Excluded are the words and the expenditure of 2006 room tax dollars. So we're changing one word or Bed and Breakfast Association to lodging. You're right. And then we're all, okay, and this one, initial recommendation is inserted and the Chamber of Commerce will let them know if their contract is renewed. <coughs> Roll call. Roll call. I agree, I'm getting so tired I can barely talk. Phil Aye. 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 Maddie. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Radke. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Susha. Aye. Van Acker. Aye. Vanderweel. No. Bauman. No. Eber. No. Eber. Aye. Sherta. <coughs> Montemayor? Aye. One, two, three, four, five, six goes. And one, two, three, four, five. Ayes. So that means your amendment fails. That's the I move to uh... yes, on the, uh, on the uh, resolution to the uh, council with the recommendation to file. I thought we just voted the amendment. We have amendment. Yes, we, we, we just voted no on the amendment. Right. So I'm saying let's send the resolution to council with the re with the recommendation to file. Second. Yes, As it's currently written, it's not good. That's pretty clear. I'll bet we'll get all the all eyes on that one. <laughs> Hold it. I have one thing. One thing. We have to vote. Right. Everybody in favor of Alderman Manny's proposal, vote aye. 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 Now, before
simply to have the aldermen bring, submit their ideas for new sites. That's it. That's what we will do on Monday night, Committee of the Whole, 7 o'clock. Your agenda will be on your email. Yes, Alderman Burke? I would need to be excused. We will do that. Thank you. Um, at that Committee of the Whole meeting, we'll get your ideas about the new places, and then maybe that list or, or, or the information that we gather will be sent on to the planning department so they can, or the city development, they can perhaps say yay or nay pretty quickly to some of the sites and then we'll go forward from there. Now if you can, when you bring those documents in on Monday or your ideas, can you make copies so we can all see what you have to pro propose, what ideas you have? Yes, Silas. Thank you. Did you say seven? Seven o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Seven o'clock. And I can't guarantee we'll be out by eight, but I sure hope so. And Mr. Bauman, Bauman, what, Alderman Bauman, what did you want to say now? All in favor? Aye. 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 Junior, uh, Steve Shirley. Yeah, last year Sheboygan North didn't lose too many games, but I believe they lost one to Waukesha. They lost four of their starters, but you're right. Uh, they have their best player back, just a junior, a 17-pointer in Steve Shirley. Now, Waukesha North, not real tall. He